the Global Democracy and Justice Lecture Series with Oded Gilad and Dina Freeman. Episode 15, Josue de Castro, World Federation to End World Hunger. This lecture looks at the life and thought of another important world federalist thinker, Josue de Castro from Brazil. De Castro was a doctor, scholar, activist, and parliamentarian who dedicated his life to addressing the problem of hunger. In the early 1950s, he was the chair of the Council of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, but came to believe that only a radical reorganizing of the international system into a more just and democratic global order could ever truly solve the problem of hunger in the world. De Castro was born in 1908 in the town of Recife, the main town of Pernambuco, which is one of the 26 states that comprise today's Federation of Brazil. That area in the northeast of Brazil was one of the poorest areas in the country, and many of its inhabitants were descendants of the African slaves that had been trafficked during the colonial Atlantic slave trade. De Castro himself was born to a middle-class family of mixed European and indigenous Indian descent, and while relatively wealthy in the local context, he grew up very sensitive to the issues of race and poverty and ultimately of hunger. His father was a small cattle farmer selling milk to the local markets, and his mother was a teacher in the local school. They separated when Josue was just four years old, and he was mainly brought up by his mother. He used to play in the street with the poor, barefoot neighborhood boys, and through them he learned about the chronic, ever-persistent hunger that was present all around him. He was a sensitive boy, and suffering caused by hunger made a big impression on him. He later wrote, It was not in the Sorbonne or at any other savant university that I learned about the phenomenon of hunger. It appeared spontaneously to me in the miserable neighborhoods of Recife. This was my Sorbonne the mud of the Hasifa mangroves. De Castro was a good student, and after high school, he went to Rio to study medicine at the University of Brazil, where he graduated in 1929 as a physician. In 1932, when he was only 24, he returned to Hasifa to take up a position as a professor of physiology at the city's medical school. Soon, however, he became interested in more interdisciplinary approaches to understanding the problem of poverty and hunger, and in the following years, he went on to become a professor of anthropology at the Federal District University, and then a professor of human geography at the University of Brazil, where he created the Nutrition Institute and served as its first director. During the 1930s and early 40s, his academic work focused on the issues of hunger and poverty in Northeast Brazil. He spent time talking to people living in poor communities and sought to understand both the profound impacts of hunger and the social and political factors that enabled and created it. Going against the deterministic approaches that were dominant at the time, such as Malthus's idea that hunger was simply a result of overpopulation, he developed a much more nuanced and contextualized analysis of the causes of hunger in Northeast Brazil and showed how hunger was a direct result of political decisions and social policies. Alongside his academic studies, which quickly made him one of Brazil's leading experts on food and food policy, De Castro sought also to engage in practical political activism to reduce the appalling hunger that he saw all around him. In 1933, he chaired a municipal committee in Recife, which carried out the first major survey of poor people to be conducted in Brazil. In 1935, he became involved in the campaign for a minimum wage, and later he co-founded and directed major associations that studied and campaigned for food security. In these years, he was also invited by the governments of several other countries to study their own problems of food and nutrition, including Argentina, the United States, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, and France. In 1946, he published his first major book, The Geography of Hunger. This was a groundbreaking work which brought together his research about the political aspect of hunger in Brazil. He argued that the terrible poverty and the lack of access to clean drinking water and adequate food that affected most of the Brazilian population was not inevitable, but the result of a particular economic model that perpetuated shocking poverty and inequality. 
His book had a huge impact in Brazil and triggered a nationwide debate on the problem of hunger and poverty as a social and political issue. Based on his diagnosis of the hunger problem, the first collective food services were created, the school meals program was established, and programs through which employers paid subsidies for workers' meals were created. The book also led to the growth of his international reputation as a world-leading expert on hunger, food and nutrition, and to the beginning of his involvement with the newly established United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO. In 1947, he became a member of the FAO's Standing Advisory Committee on Nutrition and began to take part in high-level international discussions about world food policy and how to eliminate hunger. His experiences at the FAO led him to turn his attention to the situation of world hunger, and in 1951, at the age of 43, he published his next book, The Geopolitics of Hunger. This book was a wide-ranging scholarly tour de force looking at the causes and consequences of hunger across the world as a whole, and suggesting radical new paths towards a world with no hunger. The book was soon translated into some 25 languages and became widely read around the world, setting De Castro as an international expert on the issues of food and nutrition. The first section of the book set out a detailed description of what hunger is. He looked at not just total hunger, which is the lack of sufficient food in general, but also specific types of silent hungers where there are deficiencies in specific nutrients or vitamins in the food that people do have. In each case, he explained how the particular hunger influenced human physiology and had profound impacts on human functioning, physically, cognitively, and socially. He described how hunger led not only to starvation and death, but on the way also caused physical stunting, learning difficulties, and many other miseries which afflicted the hungry. At this time, around two-thirds of the world's population, mainly the black and brown people living in the colonies, were suffering from long-term chronic hunger, and de Castro indignantly argued that there was a conspiracy of silence about this huge world problem. The second section looked at the causes of world hunger. It consisted of several detailed case studies from different parts of the world, including India, China, Africa, Europe, and the south of the United States in which he traced historically the underlying social, political, ecological, and economic forces that led in each situation to collective hunger and starvation. These detailed studies often yielded surprising results that went against the conventional wisdom of the time. For example, he convincingly showed that the African diet used to be far more varied than it had become in the 1940s and he provided detailed data about African tribes who had shown no signs of malnutrition when they had lived according to their traditional way of life, but, and I quote, as soon as they go work in the factories and take up a diet under European influence, typical deficiency diseases begin to destroy large numbers of them. In another example, he showed that the rising of vitamin B deficiency in Amazonia during the rubber boom was due to the shift in eating habits from traditional fare to canned European food. Putting these and many other detailed case studies together, he argued that the high rates of hunger in Africa, Asia, and Latin America were not due to general backwardness or overpopulation, as was commonly thought, but were rather the direct result of European colonialism and imperialism. European colonialism had destroyed many well-integrated and flourishing societies and reorganized the global arrangement of productive agriculture in a way that suited European interests. It had created large land holdings and single crop cultivation, diverted land use from food production for local consumption to the production of cash crops for export, and led to a massive exhaustion of the soil and ecological destruction in the search for quick profits. The result was that food was systematically sucked out of the colonies and sent to the colonizing powers. While the colonizers enjoyed a rich and diverse food intake for a low price, the majority of the world's population in the colonies suffered hunger, starvation, and misery. In making this argument, he was seeking to refute the idea promoted by Western scholars, such as Malthus, that hunger was simply the result of overpopulation. Instead, he put forward a very detailed and convincing analysis 
that showed that in fact it was the other way around, that overpopulation was the result of hunger. Yes. He brought statistical evidence to show that in a wide range of countries, there was an inverse correlation between the consumption of proteins and birth rates, i.e. the less protein in the diet, then the higher the birth rate. And he also drew on evidence from laboratory experiments with animals that showed the same thing. He even pointed to a possible biological mechanism to explain that pattern, arguing that protein deficiency leads to a reduction in the liver's ability to inactivate estrogens in the body, and that the subsequent rise in estrogens increased women's fertility, leading to more babies. But most importantly, this was not just an academic argument. How scientists understood the cause of world hunger would shape the types of solutions that they offered to it. The Malthusian notion that world hunger was caused by overpopulation implied that the blame for world hunger rests on the poor people themselves, and that therefore the solution is to reduce fertility and childbirth in the colonies or the so-called developing countries. But if, as de Castro argued, world hunger was actually a social and political creation caused by the unjust pattern of the organization of world food production and distribution, then the solution would be to change that pattern. De Castro brought convincing data to show that the food produced in the world was more than enough to feed everyone. The problem was not a shortage of food, but the extremely unequal distribution of that food. And this led to the third and final section of the book, where he began to develop proposals for solutions to the world hunger problem. While he looked to new technologies to improve levels of food production, his central argument was that the most important thing was to change the structure of the world system. Most basically, this would require, in his words, quote, a radical transformation of the social structure of the world, and full and harmonious integration, at the same time economic, technical, social, and human, permitting the enhancement of resources and possibilities. He argued that the geography of hunger could be transformed into a geography of abundance, if colonialism would end and if there would be, quote, the transition from a colonial economy to a cooperative world economy based on mutual interests. In contrast to the international development theory, which was emerging at the time, and which called for all sorts of state-led projects of industrialization, under the benign oversight of the Western powers, De Castro instead argued that the contemporary poverty, hunger, and inequality was a direct result of underdevelopment of the colonies that was caused by the West. Instead of development, he called for, quote, the collective emancipation of humanity, such that all the areas of the world would be integrated into one global system, based on cooperation, mutuality, and reciprocity. In this way, global food reserves could be spread more evenly over the planet, with food surpluses from rich areas being transferred to poor areas, such that everyone would have a healthy and balanced diet and no one would suffer the misery of hunger. He thus argued against agricultural nationalism and the competition between states for power, wealth, and food, and instead he called for a more humane economy, one that served to benefit all of humanity rather than to amass never-ending wealth for the few. And finally, he believed that hunger was one of the main causes of war, and thus he also saw that evening out the world's food consumption and eliminating hunger was crucial to reach world peace, which was a major concern at the time in the aftermath of World War II. But while many peace activists in the West focused on disarmament as the way to world peace, De Castro called for a deeper look at the root causes of war, and argued that creating a more equal world where no one was hungry would remove many of the key drivers for war, and thus be a far more effective way to bring about peace. As he wrote, and I quote, We will never achieve peace in a world divided into abundance and deprivation, luxury and poverty, waste and hunger. We must put an end to this social inequality. This book, on top of his years of academic study and activism, solidified De Castro's reputation as a world-leading expert on food and nutrition and led to his election in 1952 as the chair of the Council 
of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO. De Castro's involvement with the FAO had already started five years earlier in 1947, when he became a member of the FAO's Standing Advisory Committee on Nutrition. And indeed, much from that experience had fed directly into the analysis of his book. It is worth taking a step back here and having a look at what happened in those earlier years in the FAO. At that time, the FAO had been under the leadership of its first Director General, John Boyd Orr, a Scottish physiologist and international food policy expert who had been working since the 1930s on hunger and nutrition in the United Kingdom and worldwide through the League of Nations. In the 1920s and 30s, in the aftermath of World War I, food supply had been a very serious issue and there had been a growing sense that the food system needed to be managed globally. Arthur Salter, who had been head of the economic department of the League of Nations at the time, had even proposed the creation of an international food board which would prevent price fluctuations on world markets through the purchase and sale of food commodities and would balance regional deficits in distribution via prompt aid shipments. Boyd Orr had been much influenced by these ideas and when he took up the leadership of the new FAO in the years after the Second World War, when again hunger and starvation were becoming massive global problems, affecting not only the colonies but also Europe. He drew on these ideas and developed them further as he sought to make the FAO into an organization that would abolish hunger for everyone, everywhere. In 1946, he developed a proposal to establish a World Food Board, which would have the power to stabilize the prices of agricultural commodities on world markets, to establish a world food reserve adequate for any emergency that might arise through crop failure in any part of the world, and to fund the distribution of agricultural surplus from producers to those countries urgently in need. According to Boyd Orr, the World Food Board would dampen social unrest, stabilize world prices, double the food supply, and eliminate world hunger. The activities of the proposed World Food Board would mean that food-deficient countries would receive low-priced food, relatively high and stable prices for agricultural goods that they export, and the necessary credit to expand food production for both internal and external consumption. The overall result would be a global management of the food supply, and thus the abolition of hunger. Boyd Orr's proposal had received enthusiastic support from the scientists and experts involved in the FAO, including the Castro, but when it was presented to the member states at the first FAO conference in Copenhagen in 1946, the reception was much more mixed. While several governments in Europe, Asia and Latin America expressed support, the governments of the United States and Britain were strongly against. Britain did not want to lose its cheap food imports, and the United States preferred to build its political and economic dominance in the world economy through bilateral agreements, conditional aid and power politics. Boyd Orr spent the next three years trying to rally support for his plan, but Britain and the United States consistently blocked it, until it became clear that it would not pass. Frustrated and deeply disappointed, Boyd Orr had resigned in 1948. By this time, the FAO's only contribution to alleviating world hunger was providing some technical assistance and publications of some statistics. As Boyd Orr bitterly put it, the hungry people of the world wanted bread and they were to be given statistics. From his position on one of the FAO's advisory committees, De Castro had seen firsthand the geopolitics of nutrition and hunger being played out. He supported Boyd Orr's World Food Board proposal as a rational and just way to eliminate poverty and hunger and rebalance the deeply unequal world. He too was deeply angered and frustrated when he saw how the rich countries would reject a scientifically rational plan to abolish world hunger in order to maintain their own narrow self-interests. The two men shared a very similar vision for a just and equitable global food policy that would eliminate hunger and thus also war. In 1952, Boyd Orr wrote an enthusiastic foreword to the English edition of De Castro's book saluting it as an intellectual instrument for, and I quote, saving our civilization from perishing in a third world war. But being younger and earlier in his career than Boyd Orr, De Castro was not yet ready to give up on the FAO. In 1949, 
after Boyd Orr had already left, De Castro has supported another FAO initiative to create an international commodities clearinghouse in order to control the purchase and distribution of food. This would have been a mechanism to regulate the prices of labor and production globally by countries cooperating together in the common effort to abolish hunger. But again, the governments, and especially the rich governments, had refused to set up such a body and instead created the much weaker Committee on Commodity Problems, still active today in the FAO, which is strongly dominated by the interests of the US government and multinational corporations. Both the idea of a World Food Board and the idea of an international commodities clearinghouse drew on ideas of Keynesian economics, which were dominant at the time. Indeed, during the same years, governments were discussing Keynes' proposal for an international trade organization and an international clearing union, which would regulate and balance out international trade more generally, in a similar way. But these proposals, too, had been vetoed by the United States, who wanted to fashion the post-war world order as to consolidate its power as the new hegemon. And so in 1952, when De Castro took up the role as chair of the FAO Council, it was already clear to him and everyone else that the FAO had no powers of its own, but was almost completely dependent on the agendas of national governments, and particularly that of the United States. Nonetheless, De Castro tried to further the interests of the world's poor in the developing countries and argue for food policies which would reduce, if not eliminate, hunger. Less radical and all-encompassing than the proposed World Food Board or the proposed International Commodities Clearinghouse, he suggested the creation of an emergency food reserve, which would be able to provide food to starving people in crisis situations. But like all the previous initiatives, this one also was blocked by Britain and the United States, and eventually De Castro too left the FAO in frustration. Seeing the lack of decision-making power that scientists and scholars had in international politics, in 1955 he moved from academia into politics, becoming a parliamentarian for the Pernambuco state of Northeast Brazil and sitting in the Brazilian Chamber of Deputies. That same year, he attended two major conferences that would have a big influence on his future thinking and activism. In April, he attended the Bandung Conference in Indonesia. As European imperialism was beginning to indeed come to an end, at least in its direct form, many of the leaders of the newly independent countries from Africa and Asia were starting to think about how to collaborate as a bloc and how to work together to change the global system into one that was more equal and just. The first major meeting took place at Bandung, and this conference later led to the formation of the Non-Aligned Movement. This was the group of countries, De Castro thought, that would be able to lead the movement to transform the world system. And it was here that he personally met several key leaders, including Nehru from India, Nekruma from Ghana, Sekou Touré from Guinea, and many others. Later that year, in July, he attended the 7th Congress of the World Movement for World Federal Government, which would later become the World Federalist Movement, or WFM. It was presumably his friend and colleague, John Boyd Orr, who served as president of that organization from 1948 to 1951, who encouraged De Castro to come to that Congress and get involved in the movement. Boyd Orr's bitter experience in the ineffective and unjust international system led him to conclude that the only way to truly eliminate world hunger and to bring about world peace and justice was to create a democratic world federation. Only such a supranational institution, he reasoned, would be able to make and implement global policy without being subjected to the national interests of powerful states. In 1949, Boyd Orr received the Nobel Peace Prize for his lifelong activities to promote more equitable world order. And in his speech he said, and I quote, We are now physically, politically, and economically one world, and nations are so interdependent that the absolute national sovereignty of nations is no longer possible. However difficult it may be to bring it about, some form of world government with agreed international law and means of enforcing the law is inevitable. These ideas resonated strongly with De Castro's own experience in the international system, as well as his own ideas about world integration and world emancipation, and took them to their logical conclusion. And so De Castro began to get involved with the world movement for world federal government 
and also with the World Association of Parliamentarians for World Government. In 1957, he published The Black Book of Hunger, a short manifesto setting out again his vision for how the world could be free of hunger. In this manifesto, he was now more clear that the way to bring about a just and balanced world food system required a system of supranational governance, a democratic world government that would have powers over and above that of the national governments. Describing the United Nations and the FAO, he writes, The decisions depend on assemblies of national delegates who place egoistic national interests above the higher interests of humanity. To resolve a problem of such a scope, something more is needed than an international organization. We need a supranational organization freed from those sterilizing injunctions of what is called, without much basis, the national interest of each country we would need to organize a world government. That same year, he also founded and became the first director of the World Association for the Fight Against Hunger, an organization which would promote the creation of supranational political structures to assure world food supply and world peace, alongside projects to support the socio-economic development of areas threatened by hunger. In 1962, he moved from national politics in Brazil's parliament to international politics, as Brazil's ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva. Now, as a government representative rather than a scientific expert, he occupied a different position within the United Nations system with different possibilities and different limitations. In his new role, he spoke up for the developing countries and allied Brazil with countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America during policy negotiations. However, just two years later, in 1964, there was a military coup in Brazil, and suddenly he found himself deemed a subversive person and all his political and civil rights revoked. And thus, at the age of 56, he went into exile in France. Establishing himself in Paris, he returned to academia and to activism. He taught human geography at the University of Paris in Vincent, a hub of leftist intellectuals, where he worked alongside other radical scholars such as Foucault, Deleuze and Lyotard. Most of his energy, however, was now devoted to more activist endeavors. He founded the International Center for Development, an independent think tank focusing on alternative forms of development and geopolitics from a third world perspective, and became increasingly active in movements promoting global democracy and world federation. He corresponded with several leading world federalist thinkers, including Bernard Russell, Leopold Senghor, and Jawaharlal Nehru, and became increasingly convinced that world peace and justice could not be brought about through the contemporary international system in which governments compete with each other for their own self-interests, and would only be possible if all the states united into one integrated global system with supranational government directly and democratically accountable to the world's people. He got more involved with several world federalist activities and movements most notably the Movement for a People's Congress. In 1963, on the fringes of a World Federalist Movement meeting in Brussels, De Castro, along with other activists such as Jacques Savary and Jean Hassler, launched the idea of a People's Congress to draft a world constitution, as a radical step towards bringing about a democratic world federation. Most of this group were connected with the International Registry of World Citizens, an organization which worked to create a register of people who declared themselves to be world citizens that had been started by Gary Davis in 1949 and had since grown to include almost a million people. The group were well aware that there had been several previous attempts to organize similar world people conventions, building on the ideas of Rosika Schwimmer and Lola Maverick Lloyd in 1937 and including British MP Henry Osborne's attempts in 1950 but despite the difficulties, they felt that it was the only way to bypass the two great barriers to the rise of a democratic world order, which were the dysfunctional and undemocratic United Nations system and the dynamics of the Cold War. While many people in the wider World Federalist Movement still believed that the best route to creating a world federation was through reforming the United Nations, De Castro, with his years of experience in both the United Nations and the FAO, felt that this would never happen and that instead of waiting for national governments to act, it was imperative for citizens to take matters into their own hands. And so in 1966, the People's Congress launched the Declaration of 13 World Citizens, 
a short manifesto calling on people to declare themselves world citizens and to participate in the election of delegates to the People's Congress, which would draft a world constitution. The declaration was signed by 13 eminent people, including Josue de Castro, John Boyd Orr, Bernard Russell, Shinzo Hamai, the former mayor of Hiroshima, Linus Pauling, Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry, Ivan Supek, Yugoslavian scientist and peace activist, and various other Nobel Prize winners. The full text of the declaration reads as follows. In the absence of supranational law, nations are obliged to resort to force to defend their interest. The consequence is war, voluntary or accidental. And war, since the splitting of the atom and the development of bacteriological weapons, becomes the absurd final solution, the genocide of the human race. Without world institutions able to assure the fundamental needs common to all, man is helpless. Two-thirds of humanity suffer from hunger while immense riches are wasted. At the same time, scientific and technical progress make it possible to organize a world community of peace and abundance, where fundamental liberties would be guaranteed to individuals, peoples and nations. So why this contradiction? Because governments, blinded by their duty to put national interest above everything, far from accepting the necessary changes, sometimes even hinder the work of international institutions created to defend universal peace and to serve mankind. Only the people of the world, every one of us, can save the situation. The first simple but effective step we ask you to take is to register as a world citizen, as we have done. If enough of you answer our plea, we will take the second step together. We will organize on a transnational basis the election of delegates whose duty will be to defend the individual, to voice the needs of the people of the world, and finally, to devise the laws for peaceful and civilized world. In the following years, many people responded to this call and registered with the group as world citizens, and De Castro and his colleagues set about organizing a transnational world election of delegates to the People's Congress. The idea was that this would take place in phases, with elections selecting two candidates every few years. In 1969, the first elections took place. Some 10,000 people distributed across 87 countries sent in their postal votes to choose the first two delegates to the People's Congress. Josue de Castro was chosen as one of the first two. Since then, the People's Congress had organized several more transnational elections and the organization has expanded and changed its initial approach, adding also a consultative assembly to bring together world citizens' organizations and eventually focusing mainly on promoting the idea that the People's Congress should transform into a democratically elected world parliament, which could then make world law and build supranational world institutions. Whilst it hasn't succeeded in its original aims, it has succeeded in developing a large transnational network of world citizens' organizations, mainly across the French-speaking parts of the world. De Castro died in 1973, a few years after that first election, at the age of 65. Throughout his life, he worked tirelessly to bring an end to world hunger as a scholar, as a politician, and as an activist. Building up from detailed local studies of particular situations of hunger to working at the international level in the United Nations and the FAO, he came to see that hunger was a social problem created by the political structures of the world and the way that they shaped agricultural production and distribution in the interests of the rich and powerful. And thus he came to the conclusion that the only way to eliminate chronic, long-term hunger was to transform the world system into a democratic world federation, so that democratic supranational bodies could implement policies that would ensure that everyone in the world would have enough to eat. His ideas are still deeply relevant for our world today, where millions of people sadly still go hungry and malnourished and where the United Nations and the FAO remain dominated by the interests of the United States and other Western countries, now exacerbated even further with the involvement of huge transnational food and seed corporations. Today the West has a problem of obesity, while the developing countries continue to struggle with hunger and malnutrition. To end this scandal, we need to return to the ideas of Josue de Castro and of his colleague John Boyd Orr and create supranational institutions which will act according to the will of the world's people and not just the corporations and the elite.
The Global Democracy and Justice Lecture Series is also available as videos on YouTube and other platforms. If you found the ideas in this episode interesting, please share it.